Thank you, uh, Professor. And I'm very glad. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Youngkook Lee, working at the Department of Material Science and Engineering, Yonsei University. I'm also a director of Research Institute for Iron and Steel Technology, which was founded in 1995, uh, 18 years ago. Uh, first of all, uh, before getting into my talk, I, I would like to thank uh, Professors Chung Su Lee and uh, Dong Woo So for inviting me to uh, give the seminar today. What I'm going to talk today is about the effect of annealing conditions and alloying elements on the microstructure and the tensile properties of medium manganese steels. In this presentation, uh, I'd like to uh, give you a uh, brief overview on recent results on the medium manganese steels. As you know well, the, uh, advanced high-strength steels have been consistently requested and developed by various uh, industries, particularly uh, automobile industry. So uh, we can categorize uh, AHSS uh, into three different generations. So as you know well, uh, the so-called first AHSS, such as the deep steel trips and microalloy steels, have uh, have uh, relatively good mechanical properties. So you, we usually use the uh, use a parameter uh, representing the tensile strength times uh, elongation. Uh, these steels uh, possess less than twenty-five thousand MPa percent. These uh, First generation AHSS uh, consists of ferrite, bainite, martensite, sometimes some amount of retained austenite, uh, especially for uh, trip steel. So this, this, this steel is basically the BCC crystal structure, right? And then for the past decade, uh, the many researchers tried to find a new way to improve the, both uh, tensile strength and the ductility simultaneously. So new idea is uh, we want to use the FCC crystal structure as uh, indicating the austenite structure, but this time not high temperature austenite, low temperature, room temperature austenites. As you know, wire is a twip steel, high manganese, uh, high manganese trip twip steel, and the deformation band plus this these steels. In order to get the uh, stable austenite or metastable austenite at room temperature under the one pressure, uh, then uh, that's why we add a uh, uh, high level of manganese concentration. Of course, uh, we, uh, we can choose nickel or copper. However, the, uh, considering the cost and also stacking for the energy, we uh, selected the uh, manganese. And let's compare the first generation and the second generation. So as I said before, uh, first generation has uh, a BCC crystal structure or basically a ferrite matrix. However, the high mangan, uh, manganese second AHSS uh, uh, is based on the FCC crystal structure or austenite uh, structure at room temperature. And so crystal structure is different, and the microstructure is different, and the mechanical property also uh, humongously changed. So in this case, the, especially the ductility is really extraordinary. However, uh, at the same time, we have lots of problems here. So as you easily expected, the, uh, these problems. The first one is manganese content is really high, that is not uh, beneficial to the material cost and the production, product, productability, uh, and many other things. However, uh, for the past decade, uh, we tried to solve these troubles and problems. And uh, in my personal opinion, uh, we uh, made a great head to solve many problems. For example, at the very early stage, the twips still started uh, with 25 and 30 percent manganese. However, after 10 years later, uh, the manganese con concentration was halved. 
So there is a, a really good thing. And many other things. However, still, uh, we think that the high level of manganese concentration is really an obstacle to commercialization of the twist. That is true. So that means we want to reduce the manganese concentration further. And, at, uh, and also, uh, we have uh, several other uh, troubles not being solved yet. But I cannot say detail about that. So that's why uh, another important thing is uh, there is a big gap between first AHSS and second AHSS the mechanic, uh, based on the mechanical properties, 25 and 50,000 MPa, uh, megapascal percent. So it's, it's a really big jump. So these days, many people are trying to fill up the gap between first and second generation. That, that, is, uh, the, that is a medium manganese steel. So manganese content is in between low and high, and mechanical property is the same, same thing here. So typical steel is a medium manganese trip steel, and recently the lightweight aluminum added uh, medium manganese steel is uh, one of the branch, uh, in my opinion. But basically, it's a medium manganese steel. And the microstructure is ferrite. So microstructure, ferrite, BCC, and FCC is austenite, but medium manganese steel has both ferrite or delta ferrite and austenite. So everything is middle, just the mix, mixed the mechanical property, mixed the microstructure, and the properties in, in between low and high. Let me, uh, let me ask a question. So uh, could you please find the find a vague, ambiguous words in this slide? Yes. Yes. But just simple word, single word. Thank you. <laughs> but the single word is medium, high, low. So what I'm saying is I have gotten a lot of questions from many people. What is the definition of high manganese concentration? So how high? Is there any critical manganese concentration for high manganese twip steel or critical manganese concentration for medium manganese steel? So five manganese steel is a high manganese steel or medium manganese steel or low manganese steel, something like that. So I, uh, for a long time, I contemplate answering the question. And here is my answer, is my personal answer. Uh, is I will uh, give you the numbers, exact numbers, three and around 10, uh, at least based the, uh, on the binary system. Why is that? So if we look at the paraequilibrium of phase diagram, although the, there is an equilibrium uh, binary system, but uh, below 10%, we expect the fat only BCC ferrite, alpha ferrite. And more than around 30%, we expected the arsenide. But this is just equilibrium phase diagram, but usually we cannot get the ferrite. So this is more practical. And below 10%, then we have the uh, alpha prime maritime site after hot rolling uh, and the air cooling or water quenching. So you, all the time we have alpha prime maritime site in binary system. And above 10%, then arsenide change to Epsilon Martin site. Epsilon Martin site also have a chance to uh, alpha prime Martin site. Then we have some re retained arsenide depending on the process, hot rolling process. And above 15% then uh, dual phase, uh, there is arsenide and Epsilon Martin site. Above 28%, around 30%, then 100% 100 arsenide. So my point is here. Uh, keyword for the critical manganese concentration is, I think, is a retained austenite. How to obtain retained austenite at room temperature? That is a keyword, I think. So uh, above 
then after hot rolling, uh, without intercritical unmilling, we can get uh, at least some amount of retained arsenide, even without intercritical unmilling. However, uh, between uh, 3 and 10, so after hot rolling, uh, regardless of the cooling rate, we have 100% uh, 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 alpha prime multi-site. So in order to make the uh, retained austenite in these steels, then we absolute, absolutely uh, need intercritical only process. Then we have some amount of uh, retained austenite, less than 30%, 40%, something like that. The below 3%, so although we carried out the intercritical only, it is not that easy to get the retained austenite after cooling. So that's why I want to give you these numbers. And the below 3% is a conventional trip steel. It's a uh, DP steel. It's a low manganese steel uh, in terms of the manganese concentration. And between 3 and 10 weight percent manganese is belong to the medium manganese steel over which 10%, not exactly 10, but um, around there, then uh, I can say the high manganese steels. So uh, today's subject is uh, about the medium manganese steel. That means it's uh, between 3 and 10. So uh, although the medium manganese steel has the alpha prime, uh, fully alpha prime molten site structure after hot rolling, but after intercritical annealing, you can see there's a ferrite, very fine ferrite, and fine retained austenite. Uh, retained austenite volume fraction is relatively high compared to the, compared to the conventional trip steel, and the mechanical property is very, very, very excellent. So that's why the in, uh, when you study the middle manganese steel, then we have to understand the intercritical annealing process. So what's happening during the intercritical annealing? So again, the initial microstructure of medium manganese steel is uh, alpha prime molten site after hot rolling. Uh, just a simple uh, ternary system. It's a large uh, circle is manganese and small is carbon. It's a carbon mangan manganese uh, steel. But uh, during the heating, uh, the specimen will heat up to the annealing temperature which is located between S AS and the AF, and just simple heat treatments, and holding some amount after uh, some amount of holding, and then just cooling, that's it. But during the heating, uh, the reverse transformation uh, occurs uh, from alpha prime molten site to, to austenite. At the same time, this is molten site. So during the heating and holding, the molten site, uh, of course, automatically is tempered. So tempering happens, reverse transformation happens, and the, during the reverse transformation, we expect the ferrite and the tempered the molten site, the ferrite and the austenite, and the, the, these phases uh, has different solubility of manganese and carbon atoms, so elements partitioning uh, take place at the same time. So after cooling, then we have the uh, dual phase microstructure, ferrite and retained austenite, and these uh, austenite grains uh, have uh, very good uh, stability uh, due to the partitioning of carbon and manganese. Also at the same time, the grain size is very fine. That's also very interesting phenomenon. So, uh, so naturally, uh, many researchers uh, focus on studying the intercritical condition effect and also alloying elements effect. Uh, aluminum or silicon or other elements. Also, they try to modify the thermal mechanical process, processes. Not just the intercritical only, but we can add the uh, warm rolling or uh, other processes too. So there, there are uh, three different chapters in this presentation. First one is a milling condition effect. So annealing temperature effect first. Uh, from the uh, both uh, figures, uh, the conclusion is that uh, we can obtain the maximum retained austenite at an intermediate temperature, only temperature between AS and AF temperature. If you look at the, this figure around here, only temperature is around here, then we can get the maximum uh, retained austenite after intercritical only. 
uh, this still is a similar result uh, regardless of the chemical composition. So from these experimental data, we can uh, figure out that there, oh, there is a uh, very uh, optimal amyling temperature for obtaining the maximum retained austenite after intercritical annealing. Why is that? So here is the, uh, my explanation. So during the intercritical annealing, when the annealing temperature is very high, then retained austenite volume fraction is very large. But the average manganese or carbon concentration in this reversed austenite is pretty low because of the large volume fraction of austenite. And also, uh, austenite grain size is relatively large due to the high annealing temperature. So both decrease the austenite stability, right? But on the contrary, at, at low temperature, and then retain equilibrium austenite uh, volume fraction is uh, pretty low, but the, the partitioning of carbon and manganese is very heavy, so this austenite is very stable, uh, and at the same time, the austenite grain size is relatively small due to the low annealing temperature. So medium temperature, everything is uh, medium. So this is the evidence. So with increasing the annealing temperature, the manganese uh, partitioning uh, is getting uh, lower and lower. So with the increase the annealing temperature, uh, manganese concentration in austenite is, is getting lower and lower. And here is 11.6 and here is 7.3. So then during the cooling, so the final results is uh, when the only temperature is very high, then after cooling, then we have a small amount of retained <coughs> austenite because of uh, poor austenite stability. And this one, austenite stability is pretty good, but actually the austenite, uh, reverted austenite volume fraction is originally very small. That's why the final retained austenite volume fraction after cooling is also very low. So that's why we have the maximum austenite volume fraction at an intermediate annealing temperature between AS and the AF temperature. So next is the temperature effect on the tensile properties. So as you can see, the flow curve is, is a huge uh, change uh, depending on the annealing temperatures. So, so at the intermediate temperature, in other words, the, when the retained ocean volume fraction is large, then we have the good ductility and the reasonable tensile properties. Uh, another thing is interesting is uh, we can observe the uh, redox strain. Uh, is the, that means it's a local deformation. So but there are some studies on the uh, redox strain, local deformation. So when the annealing temperature is high, then we have the uh, large uh, redox strain. So when the annealing temperature increase, then uh, look, we can see the local deformation, deformation band propagations uh, through the gauge lengths of tensile properties, and the deformation uh, band formation behavior is uh, depending on the annealing temperature like this. So next is a um, uh, time, annealing time effect. It's similar to the annealing temperature effect, uh, there is an uh, optimal holding time at, uh, at, uh, at a given annealing temperatures. That means is in order to get the maximum volume fraction of retained austenite, then we have to control the annealing time. Of course, this uh, optimal time is, depends on the uh, composition uh, as well as the uh, temperature. But I can say that there is an intermediate uh, holding time is good for the, uh, maximizing the retained austenite. So again, is, uh, there, although the holding time is very short, uh, but manganese partition is still happens uh, during isosomal holding. This is, uh, this is the evidence. So of course, we want to the very short annealing time for continuous annealing line. So this so mangan partitioning during the short annealing time is very important for practicability. 
And also time factor on the tensile purpose properties. Yes, the, there is the uh, optimum ductility, uh, usually when the maximum austenite was austenite uh, obtained. And the C is just, uh, there is some uh, widow's strain too. And then, uh, anyway, the holding time factor is very similar to the annealing temperature. And the next one is a relatively new one. So my student, I uh, carried out this uh, uh, studies uh, very relative, uh, very recently. And then uh, th we used the, uh, these materials and we investigate the heating rate effect. So we carried out the lithometry, and uh, this one is a slow heating rate, is, uh, three degrees per second. And then we found the three inflection points on the relatometric curves. So first, the last one is, of course, AF temperature. That is easy. However, uh, at the beginning, uh, we are a little bit confused. Here is the inflection point one and the inflection point two. So we uh, change the maximum uh, heating temperature. So, so we heat up the sample just after inflection point one and cool down. But do this uh, telematic curve uh, during, measured during cooling, there is just constant line without any uh, changes. That means is there is no uh, martensite transformation or bainite transformation after uh, heating. Then, uh, in other words, uh, inflection point one is not the reverse transformation start temperature. However, uh, this temperature is just after uh, AS temperature, then cool down, and then we can see the some expansion. Here is probably uh, MS temperature, right? So we, and then we observe the microstructure. The first one, see, it's, uh, temperature, when the temperature is 570, that means it's before the inflection point one, then the microstructure is very similar to the initial fully marked site structure. But after uh, inflection point one, then you can see lots of cementite. You can confirm that these particles are cementite, of course. And, and these cementite particles precipitate along the less boundaries or other block or packet boundaries. This is because this is a less marathon size. So, and then this one, after inflection point two, then of course we have some cementite still in there. However, if you carefully look at here and here, then we have the uh, martensite. So this martensite is started from here. So I would say that this is alpha prime martensite. But in order to distinguish this one and the initial martensite, so both are alpha prime martensites. So we needed to distinguish them. So I call this is a fresh alpha prime martensite. This is the initial alpha prime martensite. <clears throat> and from these results, uh, we realized that this fresh alpha prime martensite nucleate at the grain boundary, but more specifically, the alpha prime martensite started uh, near the cementite particles. These particles are located at grain boundaries or less boundaries. And then uh, temperature is relatively high. So now cementite starts to dissolve. Uh, then the, there is a carbon-rich, manganese-rich regions, and then very helpful for, for austenite formation. That's why the austenite reverse transform is started here near the cementite at the grain boundary. And then during the cooling, this austenite change to martensite. That's why we have the fresh martensite at the boundary. Uh, and however, we, when we increase the heating rate, this is 50 degrees per second, but only two inflection points. So of course this is AF temperature, but we checked this point. And then uh, just uh, for this, after this inflection point, but very clean. Uh, uh, okay, uh, just before, this point, then still initial martensite. No cementite. Uh, however, after this point, just, uh, just after uh, inflection point two here, then uh, dilatation is shrinked. Uh, 
uh, due to the reverse transformation from martensite to arsenic. And then during the cooling, again, there is martensite. So shrinkage and expansion means uh, this point is AS temperature. But just before the AS temperature, no cementite, no martensite, and very clean. That's very strange. Uh, same material only change the heating rate. And after, uh, after uh, inflection point two, uh, we can get a large amount of fresh martensite there. So, and also we investigate the critical temperatures. So cemented the start temperature and AS temperature and also uh, AF temperature as a function of heating rate like that. And then we realized that very interesting and critical heating rate in there. So it's, it's about 15 degrees per second. So below this temperature, uh, all three, all three uh, critical temperatures are continuously increased. However, above this temperature, AS, uh, there is no cemented temperature, start temperature. And the AS temperature, AF temperature is, uh, was almost constant. And we observe the microstructure. So when the heating rate is very slow, then uh, austenite grain is globular and relatively uh, round grains. However, uh, at the fast heating rate, then austenite is, uh, looks like a martensite less. Okay. So also we uh, examine the manganese partitioning. So this specimen, globular slow heating rate, then there is manganese partitioning is here. However, in this case, the manganese contents uh, was not changed. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me summarize this. So be, be below the 15 degrees C per second, the reverse transformation occurred uh, diffusively. And austenite shape is globular. And manganese partitioning uh, took place. And this globular austenite is metastable. And at the fast heating rate, reverse transformation <coughs> occurred uh, diffusion lessly, and the austenite shape is less, uh, is apparently looks like a martensite. So maybe we can misunderstand, oh, this re reverse transformation didn't occur yet, but that is not the true. We already have the austenite, but shape is the same, dislocation density is almost similar, so, the, so it is not easy. But uh, if you take a diffraction pattern, then you can realize that this is austenite, not the martensite. And there uh, was no manganese partitioning. And this less shaped austenite is uh, unstable because of low manganese level, no partition. So this is a relatively new research uh, carried out in my lab. And the cooling rate effect. So Although we use the same material, same annealing uh, temperature and the holding time, but uh, mm -hmm. depending on the cooling rate, uh, the retained austenite volume fraction also changed. So when the cooling rate is fast, then we have more retained austenite at room temperature and more uh, good uh, tensile properties. Why is that? Because when the cooling rate is very slow, then you can see the cementite particles. Okay, that's why why we have the poor uh, tensile properties and uh, reduce the amount of retained austenite after cooling. And the second chapter is learning elements effects. So there, uh, there are many studies on the especially manganese effect on the tensile properties and mechanical uh, microstructures. So the conclusion is that when the manganese con uh, con concentration is increased, then retained austenite volume fraction of course increased then it's usually tensile property is getting better and better. And at the same time, uh, the manganese content also affect the reader's strength. So with increasing the manganese content, then we, we have the extended uh, reader's strain. So this reader's strain is really, really large. So we uh, observed the propagation of deformation bands. Uh, this band is going through the gauge lengths and uh, get out of the gauge part. Uh, it started from the uh, one end of the grip, and we uh, measure the band thickness is, uh, is about one millimeter, and the angle is 65 degrees. 
And we are uh, using this uh, theoretical equation. We calculate the reader's strength theor uh, theoretically and compare the strain with measured experimental data and got the reasonable uh, results. So, and then uh, many people are interested in what happens during the tensile test. So what happens uh, in these uh, regions? So I divide by uh, two stages, uh, reader's strain region and after reader's strain, stage A, A and stage B. So before tensile test, after annealing, we have about 25 retained oscillant volume fraction in our tensile specimen uh, relatively uniformly. And then we uh, selected some measure po measuring points and then uh, tensile test. So the reader's band started from here and propagate up to here, po uh, position one, and then retained oscillant volume fraction is decreased. However, uh, although this is the same gauge part, but this area uh, is oscillant volume fraction is still very high. And the more strain, then yes, again, this oscillant volume fraction is decreased. <laughs> so once the deformation bands uh, get out of, the, out of the gauge portion, then retained oscillant volume fraction is less than 10%. It's more than 10% oh, retained oscillant was disappeared. So stage B, so after reader's strain, there is no local deformation, only with increasing the strain, then uh, average uh, retained oscillant volume fraction is uh, continuously decreased. And it's a carbon effect. So with increasing carbon, of course, we have the more retained austenite. Uh, that is good. However, again, uh, the cooling rate is very important when the carbon content is very high because of cementite precipitation. So when the pre uh, we, once we have the cementite uh, due to the slow cooling, then retained austenite volume fraction is decreased and the property also decreased. So aluminum effects. As you know, well, the aluminum is uh, one of the uh, ferrite stabilizing elements, uh, like uh, silicon. So when we add the aluminum to the middle mangan steel, then ASAF temperature uh, is raised. So that is good because uh, we uh, want a relatively high annealing temperature to shorten the intercritical annealing time for, uh, for the, the continuous annealing line. Uh, not only uh, ASF temperature, microstructure also changed. So when the aluminum content is very high, then after rolling, the, we have banded ferrite microstructure and relatively large grains. And also this uh, banded structure and relatively homogeneous structure shows uh, little different uh, tensile properties. So titanium uh, effect. So we added some amount of carbon, so we expected the titanium carbide precipitation uh, during the annealing. So yes, that happens. So there is some small particle of titanium carbides, and these particles uh, refine the grain size. Compared to the, this uh, EBSD, then grain size uh, was reduced. The, when the uh, annealing temperature is around here, then we, we have fine grains owing to the car titanium carbide precipitation, then uh, toughness of the steel uh, was greatly improved. The last, uh, last one is thermal mechanical pro process effect. So uh, until now, uh, there is not huge uh, studies on the thermal mechanical process. Until now, many studies are only annealing effect or alloy element effect. But some Chinese uh, scholars uh, reported the extra uh, deformation effect. So after intercritical annealing, they have the ferrite or sanite microstructure. But uh, this one is here, just after intercritical annealing. But maybe you can find that the microstructure looks like very strange. Uh, in the previous slide, is so ferrite or sanite is a globular equax the grains. But in this case, it's a less shaped uh, uh, ferrite and arsenite. But uh, in this paper, there is no mention 
why they have the less shaped ferrite austenite. But that is also a uh, very important, uh, interesting uh, research subject that is uh, in, uh, from our uh, recent results that is um, uh, depending on the healing rate too. So this is, but uh, anyway, uh, the worm rolling, they add worm rolling at the same intercritical nearly temperature or because they change the amount of reduction. So after 57% reduction, uh, the, there is a, there, it looks like uh, elongated to the rolling direction. There is some uh, degree of uh, texture, uh, and this one is more, more clear. And also the thickness of each less is getting uh, reduced. So with increasing the uh, rolling strain, the less thickness is getting uh, thinner and thinner, but retained austenite volume fraction is slight, slightly uh, decreased. But uh, they reported like that, but I'm not quite sure uh, they considered uh, whether or not they considered texture effect, how to measure the retained austenite. So I'm not quite sure about that. But um, uh, this data looks uh, true. So before uh, warm rolling, the less shaped ferrite austenite, not the globular shape. That's, that's interesting. But they didn't know mention about that. And then uh, after a warm rolling, the less thickness is in get, getting thinner and thinner. I, I believe this, this data, but I'm not quite sure about this. So that's, and then mechanical property is quite interesting. So with, uh, this, with cold reduction, uh, increasing the cold reduction, then strength is, is uh, greatly uh, improved. And at the same time, ductility uh, was maintained, so it is good. And also, readers strain is getting larger and larger with uh, further warm rolling uh, reduction. But still, there is no mention about the re relationship between readers strain and warm rolling uh, in thin retained austenite. So I think uh, this is uh, not uh, uh, this paper uh, did not handle the all issues, but um, uh, just good uh, start point, I think. So there are many issues to study, uh, uh, effect of some mechanical process. Not only in the critical handling, uh, they added the warm learning. Maybe we can reduce the process. Just one intercritical annealing and warm learning and cooling or uh, we can modify the thermal mechanical processes. I think it's too fast. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me summarize. Uh, let me uh, intercritical annealing effect. It, uh, please just remind this result. Okay, in this medium magnet steel, in order to make a good medium magnet steel, the intermediate temperature annealing time is optimal. Exhibit the optimal retained also volume fraction and mechanical properties, and there is a critical heating rate. Uh, Hearing rate, but 15 degrees per second is just one critical uh, heating rate uh, for 5 percent to 9 percent. Uh, uh, this heating rate was not changed uh, depending on the manganese content. So medium manganese still, I think, the 15 is just one number. Uh, so slow, slow heating rate then uh, more, more stable retained austenite due, uh, due to the diffusive reverse transformation, more manganese partitioning, and around fine grains. And the faster heating rate, then uh, unstable, less shaped retained austenite, no manganese partitioning, okay? And the fast cooling rate is better. But uh, in the lab, uh, this is uh, possible, but in the real factory, but I'm not quite sure the fast cooling rate is applicable in the real continuous cooling line. But and, uh, in terms of mechanical properties, then fast cooling is better, better for more retained austenite and better uh, tensile properties. And the along elements effect, the higher manganese, and then uh, austenite stability increase, that means is we have the more retained austenite and better tensile properties are expected. And the high carbon, uh, but still, yeah, 
at the beginning, I always said that we don't want to increase the manganese content, right? That's why we uh, study the mid manganese steers. And the high carbon is also uh, the result. We have the same result. Uh, the, the, with increasing the carbon content, we have the more retainers and better uh, strengths again. But carbon increase, the welding is a problem, and many other issues. So we don't want to increase the carbon very high. So aluminum. So again, this is good because we can uh, we can shorten the intercritical annealing time by incre <coughs> increasing the annealing temperature. That is pretty good, but aluminum also uh, limited. Uh, so uh, that's why we need more more studies for medium magnet steers and uh, okay, the mechanical uh, some mechanical process. Yes, uh, we need more study. Uh, for uh, these issues. So uh, personally, in my lab, we, until now, we use the only binary system, uh, binary medium magnet steel, uh, because uh, in order to, we want to understand more clearly and fundamentally about the binary system first. Uh, so that's why we found the hidden weight effect here. And then uh, once we have the good fundamentals, then we can add more aluminum and more silicon and reduce carbon and uh, other element effects. So I think the uh, understanding of the binary system is, is a good base for lightweight steel or many other applications. Uh, okay, thank you very much uh, for, for your listening. And if we have any questions, uh, just let me know. Okay. <laughs>